Yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you all by Zoom today or, or see you again. So I'm, uh, I'm Marcela Carena. Uh, I'm a particle theoretical physicist. I'm the head of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, as you know, quantum information science uh, reached through uh, many important subfields in science and engineering. And um, just to give you a background, my own interest is using quantum information science and in particular uh, quantum algorithms to help me understand fundamental questions of uh, particle physics. For example, uh, how there is more matter than antimatter uh, that form in the early universe, or in another words, how we are here. Uh, or uh, help me understand uh, the strong forces in nature uh, that are the heat source for all the stars as the sun and uh, act on protons and neutrons uh, to produce nuclear fusion. As you will see today, this is a little subfield of all what we will see with the experts we have today. So today is, is my uh, enormous pressure to introduce my U Chicago colleague, uh, Professor David Oshelon, who will be our first keynote speaker. Um, and uh, he, uh, David is the, the Vice Dean for Research um, in the Prisker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. He's also a senior scientist at Argonne National Lab. And uh, most important is the director and founder of the uh, Chicago uh, Quantum Exchange. So um, David is, is the recipient of numerous prestigious prizes worldwide. And, um, and during his illustrious career, he held positions at IBM Watson Research Center at the University of California. Uh, and being the director of the um, California Nanosystem Institute and the director of the Center for uh, Spintronics and Quantum Computation. Now we are so lucky that we were able to attract David to the Chicago area. So the, uh, I, I'm sure David will go into that, but the uh, Chicago Quantum Exchange is, is the nation's uh, principal hub for science and engineering of quantum information and also for training the workforce uh, of, of tomorrow. Um, as I said, David is, is the director. Uh, he's accompanying the leadership of, of the quantum, uh, uh, Chicago Quantum Exchange by Professor Suprati Guha from, National, uh, from Argonne National Lab and Dr. Shosa Deacon, uh, who will also be to, uh, with us today and is the Fermilab Deputy Head for Research. Um, the quantum uh, exchange is formed by members of the University of Chicago, the Argonne National Lab, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Northwestern University. And we will have many representatives with us today. So without further ado, I give the floor to my uh, colleague, David, um, to, for his keynote presentation. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much for, um, for having me here. It's a, it really is a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm lucky to be able to speak with all of you today. So can you, can you see my screen all right? Yes. Fantastic. So let's get started. I think as you've just heard, you know, one of the most exciting things about this field is when looking at the extraordinary development of information technology overall. You know, in the 1940s and 50s, the black and white picture you see on the left was of ENIAC. And when you think about this being the first electronic general purpose computer, it weighed 30 tons, had 20,000 vacuum tubes, 6,000 switches, and needed a minimum of 150 kilowatts. And now we fast forward 60 years later, Intel is shipping 800 quadrillion transistors every year, right? Running about 150 watts. So in, in just over five decades, we made incredible progress. But now we're at another paradigm shifting moment for information technology, and that's quantum. So what is quantum computing? You know, what I just showed you was classical computing where our information is encoded in bits, zeros and ones, yes and no, on or off, and typically done with semiconductor devices, such as transistors. A quantum computer digs down a little further to the quantum properties of individual particles of matter, which can be not just ones or zeros, but acquire these very unusual quantum states, such as being one and zero simultaneously, superpositions. So these are cartoons, but you know, just to put this in perspective, in the last few years, scientists and engineers around the world have developed techniques to manipulate the quantum states of individual electrons in these devices, in today's electronics, 
with remarkable precision, such as this data, showing the quantum property of one electron in a high power electronic device going in its different quantum states. So it's, it's not just a cartoon, but it's becoming a reality. So it's very exciting for all of us. So just to take a minute to think about what is quantum science, it's really founded on two unusual principles, which don't exist in our classical world. The first is superposition. As I mentioned, the ability of a, of a quantum system or a bit to exist in multiple states simultaneously. And engineers are now exploiting these peculiarities to visualize, understand, and manipulate objects in ways we could not do before at the level of individual atoms, individual electrons, individual photons. So superposition is one. The second, which admittedly is the hardest for many of us to grasp, is entanglement. The fact is at these very smallest scales, individual particles behave in ways that simply cannot be explained by classical science. And entanglement means that information can be placed in one of these particles or a qubit in many of them that share this information and can remain connected even if they're separated over extraordinary long distances. Information is literally entangled amongst all of them. And Einstein referred to this as spooky action. It was something that really was hard to grasp and frankly, it's still hard to grasp for many of us. So superposition and entanglement. So what's this doing? Well, it's driving a field for new technology to sense, transmit, and perform computation. So this is important. A lot of us have heard about quantum information in terms of computing, but the field is much broader than that. It includes communications, it includes sensing. And by communications, I mean using these unusual superposition states as a basis for unhackable communications. Use new phenomena to transmit information such as teleportation. Computing, thinking about developing computers that can perform calculations which would be difficult if not impossible to do, even on extrapolations of future supercomputers with applications of optimization, cybersecurity, encryption. And these quantum bits, if you expose them to the outside world, are also incredible sensors, atomic scale sensors. They can probe single molecule dynamics, can be placed in a cell to look at intracellular sensing and control, can detect unprecedented tiny amounts of electric, magnetic, or thermal fields. So it's probably not hard to appreciate the applications for this are growing almost on a daily basis from finance to material science, such as predicting new materials with unusual properties, to healthcare, to election security, to energy distribution and optimization, applications in the pharmaceutical industries and biology, and they're growing. So it's an incredibly exciting time for all of us to be working together. Now, you heard in the introduction about the Chicago Quantum Exchange and in 2013 to 2017, all of us realized that this opportunity space was so large and the scientific problem so challenging, we needed to work together in a different way. Work together, not just in universities, but with industry as real partners from the very beginning and government, such as the national laboratories. So we formed the Quantum Exchange, which you heard about, which currently has over $260 million of federal funding, uh, actually last year, over 100 researchers spanning the institutions that you see below that Marcella described nicely, uh, Fermi Lab in Argonne, the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Northwestern, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So we have six member institutions across this region, premier engineers and scientists in the field, and perhaps even more exciting is we brought over two dozen industrial partners to help build a local, national, and global quantum economy and train future scientists. So what do I mean by these companies? Well, what's interesting is when you look at the companies working with all of us here in Chicago and the state of Illinois, it includes companies that you're familiar with, such as IBM and Intel and Microsoft, but if you look carefully at this list, you can see what's entering is, is the growing international presence. Companies in Europe, Asia, for example, Zurich Instruments, Toshiba, Hamamatsu, right? Materials companies such as Corning, laser companies such as Toptica, finance companies such as JP Morgan Chase, uh, and fab companies such as Applied Materials that make the foundations of a lot of our devices today. So what's interesting to us is this broad set of companies finding pathways to interact 
and thinking about applications in this rapidly emerging space. And one of the reasons, of course, we're having this event today is to welcome all of you into this space and see how we can work together. So in the quantum exchange and the group of universities you're gonna be hearing from at National Labs today, we cover communication and computing and sensing from fundamental condensed matter physics to material science, the fundamental optics to optical devices, the high energy and particle physics as you heard about, to the foundations of quantum information and building quantum architectures and quantum networks. And most important, we're doing this by building a workforce of quantum ready scientists and engineers. And how are we doing this? We're doing this by different materials platforms. And obviously there isn't time to talk about all of these in detail, but I wanted to give you the breadth of the research happening in the state of the city. Looking at photons for quantum information, what are our quantum bits? Semiconductor materials, cold atoms, trapped ions, and of course, superconducting circuits, which you'll hear about, such as the work going on at the new center in Fermilab. And the images below show real devices and real systems being built by scientists and engineers in the region. Some operating at room temperature, some at cryogenic temperatures, many of these in laboratories that can be accessed by our collaborators as test beds for devices and to explore the fundamental science. Now, what's so special about this region? In 2018, 2018 excuse me, when the federal government just before Christmas passed the National Quantum Initiative Act, it led to the competition and ultimate establishment of national laboratories and centers for quantum information science. And when you look at the United States and think about three of them that were founded by the National Science Foundation and five of them run by the Department of Energy as national centers, we're very excited by the fact that three of these centers are in Chicago and Illinois. Argonne, as you heard, runs one of the Department of Energy quantum information centers called QNEXT focusing on communications, uh, foundries for quantum bits and quantum simulators, Fermi Labs Center, which you're going to hear about, the Center for uh, Superconducting Systems that Anna is leading, is doing spectacular work with Rigetti and others on building quantum machines. And the University of Illinois has one of the National Science Foundation centers focusing on building hybrid networks, mixing these different material platforms, thinking about how they can be connected. And these centers are all working together as well to try and make the sum much greater than the individual parts. So it's a very special region here in Chicago. And we're building a quantum community, meaning we need to get these groups working together. We invite all of you to attend our annual meetings that happen in November every year that had over 1,400 participants last year around the world. We have seminars, workshops, and conferences. We have carefully honed business and faculty exchanges, which we welcome all of you to think about spending time here in Chicago or in Illinois. And we have seed grant opportunities to try and foster these collaborations by actually driving these endeavors, just providing funding in advance. But just to be clear, modest funding in advance. But the workforce is a very special problem. When we talk to our industrial partners and ask them, what is your primary concern about this explosion in quantum science and engineering? Their number one concern is the workforce. It's estimated in the United States alone will need over a million quantum engineers in the current decade. Where will they come from? How will we train a new generation of quantum engineers? So the exchange has launched two major National Science Foundation programs to develop new ways to train students jointly with industry. Having mentors in both industry and academia or national labs that stay with a student and drive their entire PhD program. We're developing new curricula through something called the QSTEAM initiative with a series of universities in this part of the country to redesign a portable quantum science program that can be deployed at universities around the world. For example, this curriculum could then be taken to Brazil and run in your universities and also uh, the analogy to our two-year community colleges. And we're offering certificate programs that were launched about a year and a half ago to train existing researchers and companies and give them the skills they need to be successful in quantum engineering and technology. So finally, I want to mention something about what happens when our students and our scientists at the national labs come up with ideas that will launch the technology. How do we develop a business environment to make this successful? And we're really excited that uh, a few months ago, we announced duality the first quantum accelerator in the United States 
to really help companies build and be successful in the industrial world. It's a 12 month program that provides the business and the technical resources. So for example, a business such as myself, you know, doesn't really have the training to be successful in the business world, should that be something I'd want to do. But by working with the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Argonne National Laboratory, and P33, a Chicago-based organization aimed to develop this ecosystem in the United States, all work together to provide this business savvy for those of you interested in launching companies using a world-class business school with leading universities together at the national labs to make sure your company and startup is successful. And we're going to announce the first cohort uh, to this competition this month. Uh, and this will happen on a quarterly basis. So those of you interested in developing companies, this is the website. So finally, um, as I approach the end of our 15 minute presentation this morning here, what are we doing in the exchange? Well, Argonne National Laboratory, Fermi Lab, University of Chicago, the University of Illinois uh, have all worked together to build a metropolitan scale quantum network. There are several emerging in the region, but the reason I wanted to show you this example is you could come and use this network with a plug and play mentality to start to try your ideas, understand how you entangle and teleport information, bring in different nodes in different locations. It started as an existing 52 mile loop. There's an extension to Fermi Lab, and this fall we'll have an extension down to the city of Chicago for industrial interactions. And it's just an example of the type of project building a national quantum test bed uh, that the exchange can do very nicely, but not alone. So finally, uh, we do have international partners. We also realize that we can learn from our partners abroad. Our current partners include uh, UTech at Delft, the University of New South Wales in Australia, and very recently the Weizmann Institute in Israel. So as we span the globe, we also welcome opportunities to connect with all of you as we build this global ecosystem for our students to gain further experience. So let me stop there. Uh, again, thank you very much for giving me a chance to share this with you this morning. And um, I look forward to helping answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, David. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring and exciting talk about our future, uh, our present first, all what we have already and our amazing future ahead. Uh, I'm sure this will uh, be a, a great starting point for strong collaboration with our Brazilian colleagues. I don't know if we take, uh, maybe we take um, talk, uh, questions for both speakers at the end of the, um, of the panel. So um, I have to say that uh, I'm really sorry that um, my, my ne the next speaker is uh, Professor Luis Davidovich, which was supposed to be introduced by uh, Professor Rogerio Rosenfeld, who is the president of uh, the Brazilian Physical Society. Um, but um, sometimes technology doesn't cooperate the way we, we would prefer. And uh, so I will, I will take on that uh, task and do my very best. Um, so I know um, I know Luis, so Luis Professor Luis Davidovich is um, is a professor at the um, Universidad Federal uh, do Rio de Janeiro. Um, Luis uh, was educated at the Universidad Pontificia uh, Católica do Rio de Janeiro and and came to do his PhD in the U.S. at Rochester University. Uh, he has held um, many visiting positions in in, in France, Germany. Uh, U.S. and and the United Kingdom, and uh, and his research has focused on the emergence of the classical world from the quantum uh, substrate, so laser theory and and cavity quantum electrodynamics, quantum entanglement, and we will hear some about that. Um, he is currently the president of the Brazilian Academy of Science, uh, I think since 2016, and most important for this venue, he's uh, the main coordinator for, um, uh, I think, for co-director of the Institute of the National Institute of Science and Technology for Quantum Information in Brazil. Uh, of course, uh, Luis uh, is also the recipient of numerous prestigious prizes uh, worldwide, and uh, and I I have the personal and direct connection with him that uh, we are both part of the board of um, the Sorafileira Institute, and that's where I met him for the first time, and this is. Um, 
um, it's like a Simon Foundation type, but for, for Brazilian, uh, uh, um, um, for, for Brazil. And so it's an amazing uh, institution and uh, that basically uh, is there to support science beyond uh, governmental support. And um, I have seen him in action and I, I have come to admire uh, his knowledge very much. So, uh, Luis, please, without further ado, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcela. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, although I'm not sure what here means in this context, maybe in the cloud. Uh, and uh, hi, David. Thank you very much for your talk. I think it will make my job much easier uh, today. Uh, and thank you also to the Brazilian consulate. I think it's a great program, this one, for the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Brazil. Uh, and thank you, Greg uh, Stevens, also for uh, organizing this. So, uh, and I say hi to all the people who are listening to us and all the uh, colleagues in this panel. Now, I'm going to do the perhaps the most difficult task now, which is to share my presentation. And let's see if I succeed. Yeah, I think I'm going to succeed. Okay, so uh, you know, maybe a uh, uh, maybe a. Uh, uh, collateral uh, effect of this pandemic is that we get acquainted with all kinds of platforms. So I don't know if that's good for the, our, our brain or not, but anyway, so can you see it? Can yes. you see my presentation? Yes, okay. Yes. So, so I'm going to uh, have two parts in this uh, presentation. The first part, which was actually reshuffling while David was, was talking, is uh, a complement, we may say, to what uh, David uh, said. And uh, I will need that even to uh, put the Brazilian uh, research in this area in perspective. So, of course, we all uh, know that, you know, uh, quantum mechanics uh, was the, at the origin of uh, many quantum technologies that really changed our world. And I always say that it's amazing that the young people who developed quantum mechanics did not have the least idea of possible applications. They were moved by curiosity and passion for knowledge. And yet, you know, 100 years after their work, the world is full of devices uh, made possible by quantum mechanics, from lasers that I used for many purposes, uh, uh, medicine, uh, laser disks, uh, nanos, nano uh, transistors in uh, central unit processing uh, of, of computers, uh, resonance magnetic devices in hospitals that allow us now to uh, actually to see uh, the brain, uh, the dynamics of the brain by uh, shown by, for instance, a patient who is answering some question and that can be monitored by magnetic resonance uh, cold bar readers, development of new drugs, uh, uh, digital uh, photography, light emitting diodes, atomic clocks that uh, are essential for the functioning of, of the GPS and so forth. So fantastic quantum technologies, but now we have what some people call the second wave of quantum technologies that started at the end of the 20th century. So uh, that came with the ability already mentioned by David to uh, control single electrons, single atoms and single photons. And uh, these are some examples of that. So uh, on the left here, you see uh, the seven ions actually, let me, okay, now I have a laser pointer. So you see seven uh, ions in a harmonic trap, harmonic electromagnetic trap which are oscillating in the trap. And this is not a simulation. This is actually a movie. Uh, we can see the ions because laser was uh, 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 sent on them and they uh, scattered the laser light so we could see uh, the ions or the camera could see the ions. It, you can actually control the motion of this ion in a very precise way. For instance, here we have all the full, I mean, the solidary motion of, of the ions. Now we have this kind of, this other kind of mode of oscillation, and you can go from one to the other, you can control this motion. Also, 
in the field of quantum electrodynamics in cavities, you can control the interaction of a single atom with a single photon, which is uh, trapped between two mirrors. Actually, they are among the best mirrors in the world. They are superconducting mirrors, and you can keep the photon inside for one-tenth of a second. You also have emitters of single photons, and all these are technological developments, ex experimental developments, that uh, have ignited, say, the imagination of people towards new quantum technologies. And I should just mention that because of these developments, David Weinland and Serge Haroche, they uh, got the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 2012. Uh, David Weinland uh, for his uh, pioneer work on trapped ions, and Serge Haroche for his pioneer work on quantum electrodynamics in cavities. And Serge Haroche uh, has had a, a strong collaboration with Brazil. We have people in Rio, in Sao Paulo, have had a, a, a strong collaboration with his group in, in Paris, and many papers have been produced thanks to this collaboration. Now, so, uh, uh, David has already uh, talked about quantum information, and I would like just to mention the inputs to quantum information. You have basically three main inputs, quantum physics, computer science, and information theory. And then the uh, outputs are quantum computation, quantum communication that involves quantum cryptography, that is the coding of messages, quantum metrology, and also quantum thermodynamics. And in Brazil, we are involved with all these four uh, inputs, as I'm going to show you in a moment. Now, that's about quantum information science. Now, as far as quantum technologies go, then we have these four pillars, uh, communication, computation, simulation, and metrology or quantum sensing. And they are prepassed. Uh, across them, you have engineering and control, software, theory, education, training, and these four pillars stand on basic science. And, and that's a very solid uh, basis for the development of these technologies. I'm going to give you some examples for each pillar, actually. For quantum communication, you see there are many companies now all over the world, many in the United States, also in Europe, China, Australia, that deal with quantum communication. This uh, amazing cover of science shows an experiment made in China where uh, a satellite was able to establish secure communication based on quantum physics between two points on the surface of China, uh, which are 1.2 uh, thousand kilometers one from each other. So uh, amazing achievements within a very short time. Quantum sensors, David has already commented on them, and they have many, many applications. You can use, for instance, a single atom to map the structure of a biomolecule. You can get magnetic sensors for brain imaging, very sensitive and very precise brain imaging. Uh, there are gravimeters that are based on atom interferometry, and they can be used for a survey of underground water and oil because they are very sensitive even to gradients of the gravitational field that depend on what is under the Earth. Uh, also, if you use these gravimeters in a satellite, you can map the Earth time-varying gravitational field, measuring small changes in Earth water mass. And this could be the next generation climate monitoring missions in space. Uh, it's uh, gyrometers, quantum gyrometers, and quantum, quantum accelerometers have also been built with high sensitivities. And uh, they are sought, for instance, uh, for getting navigation without the need for GPS. Since you know the uh, initial position, you can actually know where you are after some time because they are so precise that, that they can actually tell you uh, what is the path you are following. And that's especially important for submarines that don't have access to a GPS. So many, many applications of quantum sensors as well. And then there, is, there are quantum simulators, where they have been proposed, they were proposed by Feynman a long time ago. Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate in physics, and uh, the students, of, of course, may know him for his uh, books uh, on lectures in physics. Now, 
it's uh, that was the argument of Richard Feynman. If you have n spin, say n two level systems that can be up or down, uh, you have each spin can be in, in two states. Or if you want to think about the bits, each bit can be zero or one. If you have a sequence of bits, say n bits, the total number of states is two to the n because each can be in two states, so you just have to multiply that and you get an exponential in the number of, of, of spins or the number of bits. And you see, if n is equal to 300, say, you get more states than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's impossible to keep this in the memory of, of a classical computer. However, if you have a quantum computer, and that's the proposal of Einstein, you just have n qubits instead of two to the n states. You have n qubits and you just manipulate these qubits, which are two level systems. You make them interact and then you measure this. So in some sense, a quantum simulator is like a quantum experiment. It's like an analogic computer in which you actually do experiments on a collection of n qubits in order to find the result of your calculation. So Google has done that. This is an example of a digital simulation of some model in, in field theory. Uh, and, and, uh, and that was a simple example. That was just a demonstration that that could be done. Uh, that's the chip they used at that time. And I just want to stress here the presence of Enrique Solano, who was a student, a PhD student in our group, uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He went to Spain afterwards at the University of the Basque Country. And uh, now he's a CEO of, of a computing uh, company, quantum computing company in Germany. So uh, Google built a quantum computer and they decided to solve a problem which uh, could uh, demonstrate the efficiency of quantum computers. And uh, that was published in Nature in 2019, and they called it quantum supremacy. I mean, I'm not going to explain to you the problem they were trying to solve. It's not a very useful problem as far as I know, but it was just a demonstration of a concept. And what they claim is that uh, they could solve this problem in a time of 200 seconds. And uh, they were optimistic. They said at a time that uh, classical supercomputer would take approximately 10,000 years to do the same calculation. Well, you know, that was Google. IBM re re uh, reacted immediately, and they showed that the, their supercomputer could solve this problem in two and a half days. Anyway, 200 seconds is better than two and a half days. So it was an interesting demonstration of the power of quantum computers. And again, I have stressed the name of a Brazilian in this collaboration, Fernando Brandão, who is, who is now a professor at Caltech and collaborated with this uh, experiment on quantum computers. Now, patents in quantum information have grown a lot in the past years. Uh, in blue here, you see the, uh, the patents in, in quantum computing. This is the number of applications for patents. In red is the are the applications for quantum communication. In green, for quantum sensing. This decay here is not a real decay, it's due to the fact that data for this final year were incomplete. Okay. Now, so this is the world data, and these are the data for three countries, the United States, Japan, and China. For computation, you have dotted lines here corresponding to the United States, so never mind this decay here, never mind that, because that's due to incomplete data. Uh, full line is China. Uh, this other line here is just Japan. So you see that there is a big competition here between China in, in Brazil in quantum computation. China started much later, but uh, this is evolving. This is the uh, evolution in, the, in quantum communication, in cryptography. And there, China has the majority of patents. Many of these patents are patents uh, submitted just to China no, they are not international patents yet, but anyway, this shows that uh, in several countries, I just showed three countries, but in several countries of the world, there is a strong development of quantum computation and also of quantum cryptography. And now to Brazil. So 
Uh, we have here National Institute for Science and Technology in quantum information. Uh, Marcela has already mentioned that. I should say that the coordinator of this institute is now Belita Koehler, who unfortunately could not uh, be with us. And now I'm the vice coordinator. Uh, and this project is, uh, is really a national project. You see how many groups are involved in the project from almost all over Brazil, you know, south region, southeast, center, west region, northeast, many, many groups, many institutions, uh, many people involved. This started with uh, Millennium Institute in 2001. I was the coordinator then, and that evolved into this National Institute. In fact, in Bra Brazil has a network of National Institutes of Science and Technology. They are virtual institutes in several areas of knowledge. Now, our institute, or the present version of this institute, started in 2014, 2017. We had a previous Institute of, of Science and Technology, National Institute. The coordinator of, was Amir Caldeira, who is going to take part in this workshop. And this version here was, uh, had the headquarters in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the first uh, the first part was uh, in the period from 2014 and to, to 2017, and this was renewed for this five years period, 2017 to 2021. Uh, so the present National Institute of Science and Technology in Quantum Information counts on more than 120 researchers, hundreds of undergraduates, graduate students and postdocs organized in 29 institutions in 13 states and 25 cities in Brazil. So, you know, it's a lot. And of course, during the pandemics, we had some peace, maybe I should say, but you know, outside the pandemics, before the pandemics, it was a very active institution with workshops being promoted. Now, of course, we must have virtual workshops, but we had also, you know, two by two meetings between the institutions, people worked together uh, theoreticians profiting from the experimental uh, facilities in some institutions. So I think it really contributed to form people. And as David said, I believe that's a very important motivation for this uh, uh, assemble, ensemble of institutions to form new researchers. And that's why I'm glad to say that we have these hundreds of undergraduates, graduates and postdocs in our institutes. What are the main research lines? So here they are. Uh, we have uh, quantum information theory, cavity quantum electrodynamics, theoretical experimental and applied quantum optics, theoretical and experimental quantum metrology, dynamics and measures of entanglement, open quantum systems, quite generally, much, but of course applied to quantum information, production and detection of entangled states and single photons, continuous variables entanglement and entanglement in high, higher dimensional systems, quantum computation with condensed matter, Belita, Rodrigo are two examples of that, quantum cryptography and quantum communication, interface atom light, quantum memories, quantum repeaters, quantum thermodynamics, we have some strong work on quantum thermodynamics, theoretical and experimental, and quantum computation with nuclear magnetic resonance, cold atoms, and linear optics. So uh, maybe I have forgotten one, one, one item or another, but I think that's the basics, and that's the ensemble of, of research lines in these institutions I mentioned. Now, we have in the National Institute for Science and Technology, 12 laboratories in several institutions, I do not expect you to read all this list, but I think from just an overview, you can uh, realize that the basic systems are uh, nuclear spins probed by nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers. Uh, we deal with ions and eventually with, uh, with an ion accelerator. It's not uh, ready yet. Uh, uh, and photons. So uh, basically two lines nuclear magnetic resonance with, with uh, spins and photons. And uh, with photons, we have been able to demonstrate in many labs, many, many effects. 
Oh, I should mention also, especially at the Federal, Uni Federal University of Pernambuco, northeast of Brazil, the work, very nice work they do with atoms, interact with photons, and that University of Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, also they have uh, uh, very interesting papers involving, for instance, multicolor photonic entanglement, integrated optics, and also the uh, atom-photon interaction. So this is the overall picture. And now I'm just flashing to you some highlights in publications. Uh, so these are publications on entanglement and its dynamics. Uh, here we have publications on quantum metrology. Uh, these are theoretical and also experimental papers. They involve uh, frequently collaborations with groups in other countries. This is an example of that. That's a collaboration with the group of Serge Aroche there in Paris. Uh, we have many papers on quantum thermodynamics in several groups. Uh, and here you see a sample of that. Uh, again, there are theoretical papers and also experimental papers on that. In particular, quantum thermodynamics has been demonstrated with nuclear magnetic resonance uh, experiments. Uh, more quantum thermodynamics here. You see efficiency of a quantum auto heat engine operating under reservoir at effective negative temperatures. So many papers, uh, theoretical and experimental, in this area of quantum information, which is actually very active in Brazil. And other papers, which you know I cannot classify in the former areas, but they are in quantum information. They deal with uh, 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 atom-photon interaction. Uh, they also deal with some very basic concepts in quantum information, like this paper here on non-contextual wirings, for instance. So there, are, so there is some uh, uh, very interesting development in basic concepts in quantum information theory. Uh, again, quantum steering beyond instrumental causal networks. That's, again, a development, a conceptual development, and, and so forth. So this is the general idea. Uh, and uh, I'll just stop here, just to mention just one interesting uh, uh, output of the work on quantum computers. And that has to do with classical computation. Uh, people are now uh, doing quantum-inspired algorithms for classical computation. Uh, and these are two examples uh, of that. So uh, uh, that's related to machine learning. And uh, the first one and the second one is related to uh, this, uh, what happens in websites that uh, try to guess the consumer's tastes. And of course, uh, we know that very well. I, I, I have got to the point that I cannot even tolerate that anymore. That, you know, that if, if I make some search with Google, I have to stand you know, for days uh, uh, marketing on that specific search. So uh, I just stop here. And of course, I'm available for questions. And thank you very much again for, the, for, for this invitation. And I'm quite sure that looking at what David said and looking at what we know about Brazilian competence in this area, I'm quite sure that we can do a very profitable uh, cooperation among the Chicago and the Brazilian Institute, National Institute for, for Quantum Information. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luis, for uh, this tour de force of all the exciting things that are being done in Brazil or in collaboration between Brazil and, and um, uh, other institutions around the world. So this is very exciting. Uh, I can readily see that there is plenty of opportunity to further enhance connections that already are for sure among the scientists between uh, this Instituto Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología for, for, for Informação Quantica uh, and the Chicago Quantum Exchange with its six institutions. So I hope this will be something that will come out from, from this first kickoff uh, um, event. So I, I hear from Greg that uh, questions should be at the end. <laughs> so that's what the consulate has um, uh, 
instruct us to do. So please bear yes. with us. And uh, yeah, with that, I thank you both the speakers. Uh, David will come later on again. I thank you, Luis and David, so, so much for, for uh, giving this amazing high-level keynote uh, talks to tell us how much is going on in quantum information uh, in, in Chicago and Brazil. Thank you. All right. Well, a special thanks again to our wonderful moderator and who has been a tireless champion for this event, Marcela Carena. Also, of course, to our, our guest, uh, Luis Davidovic, and also to David, who jumped, who will be joining us back in a short period of time. We're and going to, to go. And to Rogerio, and to Rogerio, and Rosenfeld, Rogerio Rosenfeld, a super, super. Who has been a, uh, yes. a, a, a force behind the scenes in a way incredible. Yes. Yes. The, without Rogerio, without Rogerio, there is, there is no event, and so it's we have to give a special, very special shout out to to Rogerio who is who is watching us today. So we we'll invite him to come to Chicago after pandemic to celebrate. Absolutely, and absolutely, all all are all are invited, especially our, our Brazilian friends. So, with that, we're going to take a quick uh, two to three minute break, and then we're going to lead into our next uh, section, which is going to be panels by specific topics. Coming up will be quantum sensors and quantum metrology with Gabriel Horacio Aguilar, Paul Quiet, and moderator Juan Estrada. We will join you back here in about two to three minutes. And thanks again to everyone for the wonderful panels. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>